All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in our eighth annual Latino Book Festival. My name is Maria Smyre. I'm the Hispanic Resource Specialist here at the Pueblo City County Library District. And I'm here joined with Gabriela Garcia. Gabriela Garcia is the author of the debut novel of Women and Salt. This is a New York Times bestseller and editor's choice. She's the recipient of a Jonah Rona Jaff Foundation Writers Award and a Steinbeck Fellowship from San Jose State University. Her fiction and poems have appeared in Best American Poetry, Tin House, and Iowa Review and elsewhere. She has an MFA in fiction from Purdue, lives in the Bay Area. She's the daughter of immigrants from Mexico and Cuba and grew up in Miami. She is a longtime feminist and migrant justice organizer who has also worked in music and magazines. Her debut novel, um, From 19th Century Cigar Factories to Present Day Detention Centers from Cuba to Mexico um, of Women in Salt, is a kaleidoscope portray portrait of betrayals, personal and political, self inflicted and those done by others that have shaped the lives of these extraordinary women. A haunting meditation on the choices of mothers, the legacy of the memories they carry, and the tenacity of women who choose to tell their stories despite those who wish to silence them. It is a story of America's most tangled, honest human roots. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for um having me here you know i i grew up going to the library libraries have sustained me since, since i was a kid so um i'm a huge supporter of libraries and so grateful for library readers so it's a it's a true honor to be here thank you so um i loved your book it was amazing and um it really just kind of made me once you start reading you're just kind of picturing yourself in in Cuba or in the detention center or wherever wherever your characters are, you can really feel yourself yeah, in think. there. And so one question I had is what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, it's hard, it's hard for me sometimes to like pin down an exact inspiration. I feel like um, so many different parts of the book are sort of inspired by, by different things, you know? Um, I started writing some of it, as you mentioned, I worked as a as an organizer for years. And um, some of the work that I did was with women in detention in Texas, particularly um, in two family detention centers there. Um, so, you know, obviously the section that takes place there, like some of that I actually started writing during those years, long before I knew it would, you know, become a novel. Um, it was just sort of how I was processing the work that I was doing. Um, and so some of that is inspired by that, you know, um, other, other parts are inspired. Some of it is, is inspired by some of the travel that I've done, um, to Cuba. Like one of the opening chapters takes place in a 19th century cigar factory. Um, and actually the inspiration for that was a trip that I took to Cuba when I went to a museum that was actually displaying some of these letters from Victor Hugo to um, factory workers and revolutionaries during the 19th century. Um, and I became like very fascinated by that history that like um, interplay between worker consciousness and, and revolution and literature. Um, and that was the sort of spark for, for that chapter. Also the fact that my family was like very into cigars when I was growing up and I grew up around some of these um, cigars like Romeo y Julietas and Monte Cristos and I didn't I, I didn't know that those names came from like works of literature that were sort of championed by um, workers who were read to in those in those cigar factories so you know all of these things were sort of inspired by different threads um, in my life but you know it was just all of these different elements and things that I was that I was you know, obsessed with or thinking about, and it kind of just coalesced into this novel. <laughs> so um, I also want to let the viewers know that um, they need to pay attention to Gabriella's answers because 
they could possibly win a copy of her book of Women and Salt. And so the first two people that can answer a question, when I ask the question, you just email me and I put it in the chat and you'll see, um, or the, and if you have questions, ask me and I can ask Gabrielle as well. But um, the first two people that, that email me when I ask a question with the right answer will get the, a book. So um, my next question is, what made you decide to write with different generations and time periods? Yeah, so the book is, um, you know, structured non-chronologically. It sort of jumps from, from time period to time period and from character to character. And I think, um, you know, I was sort of interested in disrupting what we think of as a kind of traditional narrative structure for a novel, you know, like a, you know, rising action and there's a, there's a conflict and then there's a climax and then, you know, a resolution. And um, that's sort of very based around like Aristotle's uh, hero's quest, like a very, you know, European centered um, idea of what storytelling should be or what novels should be. And, you know, I was thinking about a lot of different things. I was thinking about sort of the way that my family tells stories. For example, when we're like, you know, sitting around the dining table and, you know, somebody brings up something from the past and that inspires somebody to think of something from the present day. And you have all these different perspectives, you know, um, different people see the same story in a different way. And I was also thinking about the way that history sort of functions, you know, that there are these like limited perspectives. There's you know, bits and pieces that you can get, but not the full story. And, you know, you, you have to sort of fill in between those between those places. And so much of the novel is about that, you know, is about stories, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories other people tell about us, um, is sort of about the echoes of history and, and those pieces talking to each other. So I wanted to sort of reflect that also in the structure of the book. Um, and just have it really play with like voice and perspective and, and jump around in that way. I think it was kind of fun to do that, to read it <laughs> that way too. Yeah, I'm glad. Each chapter really just kind of takes you away. How long did it take for you to write this book? So actually writing it, um, you know, I started writing it during uh, my my graduate school program, my MFA in fiction, and that was a three year program. So it was like a good like three years of actual drafting. Um, but I continued to work on it after that, you know, for, for a couple more years, just in terms of like editing and revising and adding some sections. So altogether, it was about like five years from the time I first started drafting to when it was published. Oh, that's a long time. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it, it varies. You know, there are people who who work on things for like you know fifteen years before they publish. Um, so I tend to favor sort of letting you know taking my time and letting the work come together, even if it's not you know publishing all the time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with parts of your book taking place in different locations such as the detention center or, or a Cuban cigar factory in 1866. Um, how long and what kind of research did you have to do for this book? Because I'm imagining quite a bit of research went into it as well. Yeah, I'm, I mean, so some of those sections that you mentioned, like the detention center, um, it didn't actually take that much research because that was like the kind of work that I was doing for a lot of years. Um, so a lot of that, you know, a lot of that detail just came from, from me visiting the detention center, from frequently talking to organizers and lawyers who were, um, working at those detention centers. Um, I think what probably took the most, like, actual research was the historical sections. Um, that was, like, the work that kind of required looking at archives and, you know, old photographs and going through, like, you know, especially that first section in the 19th century features a lot of real material, like real letters, real correspondence, real literature from that time. Um, so that took a little bit more research. Um, 
and you know, some of it was also just like being in Cuba and like, you know, fact checking a few things there. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I was also just drawing, like I said, on personal experience, you know, being in those detention centers, um, growing up in Miami. Mm -hmm. Did you have fun in the archives, <laughs> digging in there? Was it kind yeah. of interesting? Yeah, I, yeah, it was, it was fascinating to sort of find some of those connections. You know, it's also really easy to just get like boggled down in the research and not do the writing or to find like really interesting information that um, I'd want to include in the book, but like that maybe didn't really fit in or something, you know? So that balance between research and writing can be intention sometimes. Um, you know, so I often was just like writing and then I'd hit a point where I didn't know something. And sometimes it could be as, you know, simple as like, what toys were kids playing with at this time? And then I would have to like go in and look at research and look at photographs. Um, so, you know, I tried to sort of figure out that balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would think it would be fun. Did you find any ideas when you were, what, what you were not gonna include in your book? But did you find anything that kind of inspired you that maybe later on in the future you might wanna look into writing? You know, I think like historical fiction is not my like primary mode of writing. Um, it was like the most challenging part for me. And I think, you know, I was sort of interested in challenging myself with this book. I don't know if it's something that I'm necessarily going to like go back to. Um, in part because I think it is a lot of a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's 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 like what I said, it's sort of hard when I find like information that's really interesting, but doesn't necessarily fit into the story, like just being really disciplined about what actually belongs. Um, so I don't know if I'll revisit anything. I think I'll probably do something <laughs> like completely different, but yeah, it, it was it was fun and I, I learned a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's what's great about historical fiction though. I think you'd be, great I think it would be a great thing for you to go in that direction as well just because um the readers want to learn all that information and the way you put everything together is so interesting that I think it would be great so my next question is early on in your novel we hear this phrase from one of the key characters one of my favorite characters Maria Isabel and it's the phrase is we are force where does that come from and what does it mean? Yeah, so um, the phrase when you hear it in that in that part of the book is directly drawn from um, that letter from Victor Hugo to, it, it's addressed to the women of Cuba, you know? Um, and I think the, the whole phrase is like, we are weakness, no, we are force, you know? And I think as I was going through some of this material, some of these letters, I was really, I was really struck by that um, phrase in particular, you know? Because I think, you know, I love, I love multiple meanings and things. And I feel like that there's so much in the word force, you know? Um, there's like historical forces, there's a kind of strength, like an inner force, there's force in terms of, you know, sort of being forced into something or having like little agency. There were all of these sort of connections and emotions that I could connect to in this in this one phrase. And so that felt like a good entry point to kind of explore all of these different generations of women. And I was interested in how, you know, this one phrase passed, passed through all these generations or encountered by different people could take on different meanings, you know? Um, you know, I, I'm interested also in, in that way that stories function, you know, that they, it can be the same words on a page, but different people reading it are adding their own, you know, interpretation are, are sort of, these things are always kind of living documents, you know? And so, um, so I sort of wanted to leave it, you know, kind of ambiguous and not like define specifically what this phrase could come to mean for different people, you know? Um, but, 
but yeah, I, I liked it. And it ended up, you know, coming up throughout the book. So you are also a poet and I can really see that influence in your writing with this novel. Um, how long have you written poetry and how do you think that influences novel writing? Yeah, so I, so yes, I, I also write poetry and published um, some poems. I've been writing poetry since I was like a kid. It wasn't good poetry, you know, um, but you know, in terms of sort of really studying and reading and taking my, my poetry work seriously, I think, you know, that probably happened, um, you know, also kind of in the past six or seven years. Um, and how it's influenced my writing. I mean, I think, I think one of the most like useful things I ever did for my writing was to start reading a lot of poetry and to um, take a, a class on poetry and to like really think about poetry on a deeper level um, because it, it made me think about, you know, so many different elements that I think are relevant to fiction writing, like sound and rhythm and sentences and images, you know? So I think a lot of that, you know, improved in my writing because I was reading poetry regularly. And that's something that I always like suggest to people who are um, writing fiction and, you know, ask for like advice on, on improving their writing. Like, I think, I think reading and studying poetry is, is so, so useful, you know, and I think has, has such reverberations in all kinds of writing. Yeah. Um, what does your family think of women in salt? My family is, you know, incredibly supportive of my writing. My mother was like, you know, one of the early readers of, of the novel and absolutely loves it, you know? Um, and I have, you know, I have other writers in my family, not necessarily fiction, but like my aunt is a is an academic who's published, you know, academic books. And, um, you know, I have a lot of artists in my family. They're, they've all been like super, super supportive of it. And I mean, it's not, you know, it's not an autobiographical book. Like my family is super different from the family, you know, the different families that I'm writing about in the book. Um, but they, you know, they've been great. They're, they're like my biggest champions. <laughs> that is great. Okay. Um, and you have really interesting and complicated characters in this book. Is there a character that you identify with in this book? I mean, I think there's always going to be um, a little bit of me in everything that I write, you know? Um, but all of the characters in the book, I think, are are significantly different from me in, in very specific ways, you know? Um, so I, I think there's, like, you know, points that I connect to with all my characters. There are also ways that, you know, all of my characters frustrate me or, or you know, act in ways that are really different than how I might act in a situation. Um, you know, some of them were easier to sort of access for me. Like, I think when I started off, I wasn't necessarily sure um, if there was going to be like one character that sort of was the most recurring character that the story functioned around. I think that ended up being Jeanette. Um, and I think maybe part of that is that, you know, there were certain ways that I could access that more easily. Like we are of a similar age and grew up, you know, in a similar era in Miami. Um, so there are ways that I could sort of more easily envision her character, even if we are quite different. Um, yeah, you know, so so I think maybe that's just naturally why that ended up being the one. Yeah. Do any of your family or friends see themselves in your book? As well? um, I mean, my family is very, very different in a lot of key ways, you know, like just in almost every way. Like I write, you know, the, the central family, Jeanette's family is this like very wealthy family in Miami. Um, I didn't really like, I didn't grow up in a, in a wealthy family. And, you know, Jeanette's mother sort of represents some of the like 
old guard Cuban American way of thinking. Um, you know, she's like not very supportive of Jeanette going back to Cuba and you know, all of that. And my family was like very much not that, you know, I grew up going back to Cuba, you know, my my mother always traveled back to Cuba, was very supportive. So like they're pretty, you know, pretty different. Um yeah, you know, I like I like I said, I think I I there's p- bits and pieces of me and everyone of my characters, but in a lot of ways, like I I'm just like not I'm not super interested in like delving into my own personal history. Um because I think it's really hard to not have like also just have a very specific sort of biased perspective in terms of my own life like there's like there's a reason why i can't i don't think i'd be good at writing memoir you know (laughs) um it's much easier for me to sort of imagine characters that that i have access to like i feel like i know a lot of of people like jeanette or like carmen um you know i grew up around a lot of families that are similar in some ways um or like gloria Gloria's story, like I sort of was drawing from a lot of the stories that I heard when I was working with women in detention centers, but none of the characters are specifically based on like one person, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you plan on having this book to be released in Spanish? I mean, I, I would love to have it in Spanish. It's sort of, I mean, the way it works, it's kind of like I haven't a foreign rights agents who sell the translation rights. So I've sold like quite a quite a few of them. And I don't really know much about how any of that works. Like I just sort of hand it off to my agents and they figure it out. Um, but it'd be awesome, you know, in the future to have um, a Spanish translation and um, be able to share it with, you know, other people in my life who read in Spanish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um- what are the themes and subjects that you are interested in exploring in your future writing? You know, I, yeah, it's hard. I feel like a lot of what I'm interested in comes up in my work, you know, like in this novel, you can see so many different things that I was interested in yeah. um, from the work that I was doing around detention, probably in all the work I was doing around like feminist organizing, um, Cuba, you know, being a U.S. born person who who travels back to Cuba, you know, all of these elements sort of come up in my work and I imagine would probably come up in future work as just like things that I'm really interested in. Um, I think when I'm writing, I'm really starting from a, a place of thinking necessarily about like theme or issue, you know, I'm usually sort of starting with a character or an image, you know, there are like a lot of the chapters open up on an image, you know, like a body washing ashore or um, a panther growling in someone's house, you know? And and that sort of is where I, I start, start with the work. And then, you know, I think some of those larger things that we think of as theme, like just come up naturally in the work because that's like what I'm sort of interested in. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm sort of, I sort of like to let that stuff more, more naturally, more organically, my obsessions come into the work, but start from a place of like individual people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, would you like to read a section of your book for us today? Sure. Um, I thought I would just, I can just read like from the first chapter. Um, in case, you know, some, some people here haven't read the book. So yeah, this is kind of the opening to the book. Jeanette, tell me that you want to live. Yesterday, I looked at photos of you as a child, salt soaked, sand breaded, gap tooth, and smiling at the edge of the ocean, my only daughter. A book in your hand because that's what you wanted to do at the beach. Not play, not swim, not smash run into waves. You wanted to sit in the shade and read. 
teenage you spreads like a starfish on the trampoline? Do you notice our crooked smile, how we share a mouth? Teenage you, Florida you, grad night at Epcot, two feet in two different places. This is possible at Epcot, that Disney tiny world, to stand with a border between your legs. Sun child, hair permanently whisked by the wind. You were happy once. I see it looking over these photos, such smiles. How was I to know you held such a secret? All I knew was that you smiled for a time and then you didn't. Listen, I have secrets too. And if you'd stop killing yourself, if you'd get sober, maybe we could sit down. Maybe I could tell you. Maybe you'd understand why I made certain decisions like fighting to keep our family together. Maybe there are forces neither of us examined. Maybe if I had a way of seeing all the past, all the paths, maybe I'd had some answer as to why. Why did our lives turn off this way? You used to say you refused to talk about anything. You refused to show emotion. I blame myself because I know your whole life you wanted more out of me. There is so much I kept from you and there are so many ways I made myself hard on purpose. I thought I needed to be hard enough for both of us. You were always crumbling. You were always eroding. I thought I need to be forced. I never said all my life I've been afraid I stopped talking to my own mother and I never told you the reason I came to this country, which is not the reason you think I came to this country. And I never said I thought if I didn't name an emotion or a truth, I could will it to disappear. Will. Tell me you want to live and I'll be anything you want me to be, but I can't will enough life for both of us. Tell me you want to live. I was afraid to look back because then I would have seen what was coming. The before and the after, like salt whipping into water until I can't tell the difference. But I can taste it on your skin when I hold your fevered body every time you try to detox. Every story then knocked into ours. I was afraid to look back because then I would have seen what was coming. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. See, nice. that's that's why I I am not a poetry reader, but it makes me want to, after reading this book, it makes me want to read your poetry because it's just, I don't know, there's something about putting those words together that you have such a gift for. Oh. So we do have a question from the audience from Patty. And Patty is asking, how did you come up with the title of Women and Salt? Good question, Patty. Yeah, so that's actually um, a great follow up because I think I, I think about a lot of titles for my fiction in much the same way I think about them in my poetry. Um, so it's not a literal title. It's not something that comes up as a phrase in the novel. But I sort of went through the novel after I'd, I'd written it and looked at what kinds of words came up a lot, what kinds of images came up a lot. Um, salt was something that came up a lot. Like you can see it even in, in what I just read. And I knew I wanted women in the title because all of the voices in the book are the voices of women. Um, and I liked that salt could so, sort of evoke so many different things within the book, you know, certainly the ocean and, you know, that relationship between family in Miami and in Cuba, um, in Texas, you know, all of that. And, you know, there's, there's salt the way it, it sort of relates to the body, to sweat, to tears, you know, there, there were just all of these different ways um, relates to earth, you know, all of these different things. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I wanted the title to sort of evoke emotion more than like literally tie into something concrete, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
So I have, if anybody else has a question, feel free to ask. My next question is I'm wondering, what are you reading now? Yeah, um, so I've been reading all kinds of, of stuff, you know, both, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, I've been reading this, this novel by Tori Peters called The Transition Baby. That is, um, it's a story of a family, basically a, um, a cis woman and a, you know, someone who detransitioned de um, from, from being a, a trans woman um, back into identifying as a man and, um, and, and like an ex girlfriend who is a, a trans woman and how they all decide to raise a baby together. And it's just like a really beautiful um, and interesting meditation on, on family, on motherhood, on womanhood. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I'm reading a book that's coming out later. It's not out yet, but it's by Clevi Snatera. It's called Neruda on the Park. And it's about a, um, a Dominican family in a neighborhood that's rapidly gentrifying. Um, and sort of, you know, all these fractures within the family. It's, it's a really, it's a really beautiful story that it, I'm not sure exactly when it's coming out, but I'm really excited um, for this author. And I think it'll, it'll be a big book. Um, and let's see, what else, what else have I read recently? There's another book called Velorio by Javier Navarro Aquino. It's, um, he's a, a Puerto Rican writer and he's, he wrote this novel about, you know, this this group of people after Hurricane Maria, who sort of are drawn into this figure. Um, it's it's kind of like a an analogy for you know the ways that power corrupts and all of you know just you know everything that happened after Hurricane Maria. It's it's really also very well written that I'm I'm very excited about that I think also comes out like in the next few months. So lots of good books coming out. It's going to be a really fun month. Great. What are some of your favorite books or writers that you have? Yeah, it's so hard for me to like, you know, pinpoint favorite writers. Um, but, you know, some of the books that I just have found myself like returning to constantly. Um, Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar is like, and, and her poetry too is a book that I return to a lot. I think it's just in terms of how, you know, the way that it's written, it like every sentence, every paragraph is just so well constructed. Like I just really admire her prose, um, but also it's just very evocative. Also, it's just like you, you feel the emotion, you feel these characters really deeply. Um, so I'm, I feel like I'm always returning to her to her writing and, and studying it. Um, I've read a lot of Toni Morrison. I think, you know, I learn something new every single time I pick up um, one of her books and just in terms, again, of everything, you know, character and um, and sound and, and dialogue and, you know, sim symbols and image, like is just a constant teacher. Um, I read a lot of James Baldwin also, I think, in terms of beautiful sentence writing is another one. Um, mm -hmm. Those are a few. Yeah, wow, that is great. So a lot of good uh, good books for, for our, our audience to start looking into. <laughs> one of our books um, for the summer reading was, um, for adult summer reading was Beloved by Toni mm -hmm. Morrison. So mm -hmm. we, we did a, a few events for that as well. So we really love that book <laughs> here. So thank you so much for joining us today, Gabriella. Um, if anybody is interested in winning a couple of copies of Women in Salt, um, the questions that you needed to pay attention to <laughs> um, is how long did it take for Gabriella to write this book? So if you know the answer, email me. My email's in the chat, mariasmeyer at pueblolibrary.org. 
or in the next question. So that's how long did it take for her to write this book? And then my next question is, can you list one of the books, I'll go with just one, of the books that um, Gabrielle is reading now? So if you could remember one of those, email me and I will talk to you and we'll get together and figure out how to give you one of her copies. So thank you so much for joining us today in our eighth annual Latino Book Festival. And thank you, Gabriela. We are going to all be keeping an eye out for your next books and um, we'll be watching you <laughs> and ready to read your next one. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, the, um, you know, like I said, just so grateful to be here. So grateful for libraries. So grateful for everyone tuning in and connecting to the book. So thank you. Thank you. And so we will see you all. Thank you so much for supporting this program. And I am looking for a banner. So we're gonna we're gonna head out, but thank you everyone for joining us today. <laughs>